నమస్తే जब सवेरे समय है तो पैंतीस दो बजे एक मिनट तुरंत कल छोड़ो बारह से चार होते
हेलो 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 वॉइस आ रही है हेलो 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 साउंड आ रही है कि नहीं अरे लाइन इन में लो ना सिस्टम खोला है ऑडियो इन में लो हम्म हेलो हेलो कौन से में लगाई है ऑनलाइन ऑनलाइन हेलो 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 ओके अब यहीं से पढ़ाएंगे हेलो 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 ठीक है सवेरे थोड़ी सी सवेरे में शुरुआत के पांच मिनट चलो ठीक है बैकअप में रहेगा नहीं डबल कब आएगी जब एक साइड में कर दोगे इनको अलग अलग साइड में करोगे तो नहीं होगी इनको हेलो टेस्ट हेलो 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 हेलो
हेलो बोल दीजिए लोगों को आने के लिए वो हो कहा गया मेरा प्रोग्राम वो रखा लोग जरा कॉल कर लीजिए देर इज सम डिले इन दिस सेशन because uh, the earlier session uh, was uh, 15 minutes late so oh, i think uh, that uh, this is the time to resume uh, for the next session and this is uh, one special session and this session uh, is organized in the honor of uh, late professor brijraj chauhan Uh, uh, he has been a leading sociologist of india and uh, he has been president of indian sociological society uh, in 80s and uh, <clears throat> he produced a number of good scholars and who are working uh, in different uh, universities of india and abroad his uh, major specialization was uh, rural sociology and uh, he was uh, the first person who challenged uh, the concept of uh, community of uh, redfield robert redfield Uh, professor chauhan uh, by training was uh, uh, a social anthropologist uh, at uh, uh, university of lucknow which was the center of uh, social anthropologists yo bhai meeting chalu hai ki nahi ha are yaar abhi to kare sab theek kaam kar raha hai ये तो पुराना है Oh. Uh, I welcome uh, Professor Rajesh Mishra. Uh, he is uh, online from London to address uh, or to deliver uh, a special lecture in the memory of late Professor Brijraj Chauhan. I don't know whether what I was speaking earlier uh, was audible on Zoom meeting or not. Let me confer with uh, Professor Mishra. Yes, everything is audible. Okay, so can I continue that? Yes, yes, yes. Unka sound karo. Everything is audible. So I was saying that uh, uh, Professor Chauhan was the first who uh, actually. challenge the findings of the robert redfield on the concept of little community what he has given and uh, i think uh, there was academic discussion at the time 
uh, of uh, rural urban uh, continuum and uh, in his first uh, uh, work that is the Rajasthan village he challenged this uh, notion of uh, uh, little community and emphasized that uh, rural community and urban community are not uh, two different uh, analytical categories but there is a linkage between the rural and urban uh, communities or rural and urban societies so in continuity of the rural urban continuum uh, he has uh, uh, proceeded further in his whole career being a uh, especially in the field of rural sociology uh, he started to work uh, in the field of rural urban articulations and that how these two societies have a continuum and have continuous interaction these are not in isolation so in this sense the little community concept is not much relevant for the understanding of the rural societies and uh, robert redfield said, said that uh, rural communities are like atoms uh, which are independent self sufficient and that self sufficiency notion was challenged by professor chohan and most of his students uh, worked in this field and i am also one of those who worked on uh, this rural urban articulation and later he has applied the concept of social network for understanding rural uh, articulation or interactions but apart from him he was also a trained sociologist uh, from berkeley and uh, he did double masters from uh, berkeley california uh, with the kingsley davis was there he was having a good interaction as a teacher with him and he was highly influenced by kingsley davis so i think uh, he was having a both kind of training of anthropology social anthropology as well as of uh, hardcore sociology of uh, you know american sociology uh, which was developing at that time uh, in 1960s in uh, america so this uh, rare combination professor chauhan was having so he was not just uh, uh, working in the field of uh, rural sociology but he has also uh, provided guidance to his students in other areas and uh, the scholar today we have professor rajesh mishra and uh, he has a, have he was having a very different uh, orientation and from professor chauhan and sometimes uh, in the seminar situation we see that uh, uh, professor chauhan was on one side and uh, two uh, his students uh, one of rajesh mishra and uh, professor s satnaren who were highly influenced uh, by marxist sociology were on the other hand and there was a third professor who was uh, very much influenced by the weber and talcott parsons so he was on other side professor chauhan basically highly influenced by the work of imail durkheim so in our seminar situation we were having scholars who having uh, very in depth reading of durkheim weber and marx so a different kind of sociology emerged out of that and i want to introduce rajesh mishra as a scholar who uh, has been trained in such a sociological environment where were there was no single school dominating but all schools were in interaction and uh, he worked uh, for his doctoral work with professor chauhan and his work was on indian middle class i think it is a meeting point of uh, weberian uh, durkheim and marxian approach of class and i think uh, his work is very uh, relevant and important from sociological point of view our organization global research and educational foundation india uh, was founded in 2018 uh, and uh, in 
2019 we have conducted one conference like this and in that conference on the second day we decided to make a tribute to our great uh, mentor and professor uh, professor bigar chohan and we initiated a, a memorial lecture by uh, a leading scholar uh, in the to prepare the tribute to our great professor so first uh, lecture was delivered uh, in november on 5th uh, november uh, 2019 by one of his uh, student and who retired as professor a uh, few years back from the same department uh, where he got training from professor chohan and uh, professor jagdish kumar pundit he delivered first dr uh, chohan memorial lecture and after during corona period we could not organize a conference and now in 2022 we are having uh, second conference third conference but it, it is second after establishment of the global research and educational foundation india so i invited professor rajesh mishra he is in london he is also retired i am also retired but from academics we are not retired we are still very active and he has agreed to deliver the second Uh, professor bilraj chohan memorial lecture and uh, the topic uh, of uh, his lecture is the legacy of a positivist understanding the new middle class in india and i think with this background i think now uh, we can understand the topic of uh, his lecture because he are uh, talking of positivist that is durkhami durkhaimian uh, point of view or sociology and he is trying to understanding the notion of middle class and when we talk of class i think weber and marx both come very important so i think in his lecture you will find uh, a kind of synthesis of uh, uh, these uh, classical thinkers so i now i invite uh, professor rajesh mishra to deliver Uh, professor brijraj chohan memorial lecture to the delegates who are uh, present in person and some of them are also on line virtually connected to us professor rajesh mishra uh, thank you very much uh, professor singh i am thankful to graphi particularly this chairperson professor vp singh to give me this kind of honor to speak uh, or deliberate on uh, as a memorial lecture on a theme of my work and my choice so i'm i'm feel honored rather especially honored uh, <clears throat> i mean let me begin with the the current uh, spirit of times we know in sociology you know, a german word zeitgeist that is a spirit of times are very different bande mera these times are times of post modernism abhi theek hai critical theory nahi ho gaya and phenomenology ye yahan wala on tha these traditions are either anti positivist or uh, or non positivist at the most and in these times i am talking about a positivist our mentor prof brajraj chauhan so uh, you may think that why i am talking of a positivist in the times of anti positivism and non positivism or also these are the times of anti history as well uh and in, in the times of anti history history to talk about legacy is 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 not only a difficult one but also challenging one so let me let me uh, begin with the uh, Uh, professor uh, with 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 this argument that uh, 
in the making of sociology, not only outside India, in this Western world, but also in India, there has been a great role of what we call the positivist tradition. Not only sociology began uh, in the works of August Kohnt, who was a staunch positivist, a self-acclaimed positivist, who wrote a treatise on positive philosophy, but also uh, the role of uh, uh, Emile Durkheim, as Professor Minsing mentioned. And uh, I would consider Marx also a positivist in a different kind of tradition. So the role of Karl Marx and even Max Weber. Max Weber was, of course, not a kind of positivist in the mold of Durkheim or Karl Marx or August Kohn, but he was following the goals of positivism. I mean, that is to understand social reality in terms of certain if not laws, certain trends, certain uh, typical ideal types, you can say. So in that sense, uh, the making of sociology in the initial days was a contribution of different positivists. So it is, I mean, my argument is that in these times, it, these are the times when we should uh, uh, talk of, talk about the role of positivist in the making of sociology. As I said, that in India also, role of many positivists are great. Even nowadays, we consider, um, uh, I mean, here, sitting here, even now, we consider that Srinivas is perhaps the, an outstanding uh, sociologist of India, who was in the mold of, uh, Redcliffe Brown, and uh, of course, Redcliffe Brown himself was influenced by Emile Durkheim. So um, my point is simple, that how positivists contributed in the making of sociology, in the growth of sociology, and I would, uh, at this moment, would like to focus on our mentor, Professor B.R. Chauhan's role in making this legacy. And in a very different way, in a very distinct way, I would say, how? Let me uh, argue. So <clears throat> you know well that, uh, uh, I mean, I, when I remember Professor B.R. Chauhan's role, I find that he was in the tradition of Durkheim, as uh, told by Professor Singh influenced my, not only Durkheim, but also Robert Redfield. And uh, he was trained uh, under D.N. Majumda, who was a different kind of positivist, a social anthropologist basically, and who was emphasizing uh, the role of empirical observations, field studies. So we, we find that uh, Professor B.R. Chauhan was a step ahead of D.N. Majumdar, he was par excellence a field worker. So this is one. Another that uh, not only he was influenced by these fellows, but also he, uh, he spent a year or two with Professor Davis, Kingsley Davis. So he was in the tradition of Kingsley Davis also. So in that sense, the legacy was, was in making legacy of positivism in Professor Chauhan. Uh, you would not mind some personal stories or stories, his person, his stories of his person, as a person. Uh, when I joined him, I found him that he used to go to his uh, house in lunch, in the lunch, as well as after when classes are over at 5.30 or 6. And a nearby his house, and he would be accompanied by, by many students. 
mainly research scholars, sometimes teachers as well, faculty members as well. And uh, we, we found him discussing anything while going to his house in the lunch or uh, uh, after uh, when classes are over. And mind it, that continued for a long time. Sometimes he invite, he would invite us over lunch or over a cup of tea, would rest a bit, and thereafter he would go for a walk, evening walk, and we'll go with him. So one of my leftist friends commented that, what is this? This is some kind of uh, feudalism, as if a feudal lord is walking on the street and his edicongs are going with him. But I responded at that time only saying this, this it reminds me as if on the roads of Athens, Aristotle walking down and Plato's are with him. Mind it, that he, I mean, what I say legacy, handing down or passing on the traditions, the tradition of thoughts, the tradition of sociology, in this fashion, in a very old fashion, then we, the students would accompany him, would raise, can raise any query, even can question his ideas. And he would either talking about uh, the seminar, afternoon seminar, or afternoon lecture, or politics, uh, which he was very fond of, cricket, another his interest, and sociology, history of sociology. He would talk about all these. And these are not as if he was delivering some, some lectures of preach, pre preaching. Rather, he was deliberating, discussing, and we were also raising questions and discussions. So that is how my, my point is that any legacy, any intellectual legacy is created by is organization. The organization, we call it university. For the first time, I fe felt that university is a community with scholars, a scholar of a different, a scholar of a different tradition. So he was in fact building a community of scholars. And we owe a great debt to him that he help us as a mentor, he made us what we are nowadays. So in this way, uh, by organizing a community of scholars and not only organizing, giving, passing them a legacy, legacy of sociology, legacy of one kind of perspective, that, that is how he, he led this legacy. Not only this, I would tell you that uh, uh, as uh, Professor Singh uh, has uh, uh, told, has said that I am what he says Marxist. But remember that he said that uh, uh, you are a Marxian. <laughs> he differentiated between Marxian and Marxist. When I joined Lucknow University, University of Lucknow, as a faculty member, I came to know two things. One, that D.P. Mukherjee himself used to call himself as a Marxian rather than a Marxist. And by saying Marxian, he meant that you are an open Marxist, an open fellow who can raise question uh, about Marxian perspective, Marxian concepts, Marxian theory. And similarly, uh, D.P. Mukherjee, which we used to call D.P., was in that, that kind of a Marxian. So the point I want to say that he was, uh, he was opening a window of questioning, rethinking, reshaping, 
any positivist outlook, perspective, any positivist theory, any positivist concept. So he was not a positivist in the real sense, but he was a scientific. He was scientific. When I say a scientific, it means he was open to questions. He, he, he was open to suggestions and open to new kind of thinking, new kind of conceptual thinking as well. So in that sense, he, he, he built up uh, uh, sociology or a community of scholars in the real, real sense, a university. So this is another aspect. One thing I also would li like, to, uh, like to recall, and that was that uh, I came, when I, when I joined the uh, University of Lucknow, I came to know that Professor D.P. Mukherjee, in every evening, used to walk down from the university, university to Hazrat Ganj, which is, which is a, 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 a fashionable market those times, to a cafeteria, to a coffee coffee house and with him students would accompany and they would also discussing debating on any issue because those times were dependent times we were not independent country so sometimes uh, a national movement would be discussed sometimes youth movement would be discussed and so on and so forth so the my point is simple that Professor Chauhan continued a legacy which was passed on to him from University of Lucknow by DP kind of scholars. And he continued with that legacy to, to Merit University. Now it is a different name, but those times it was Merit University. And he, he as a mentor, he passed on that legacy to us as well. So this is how a legacy was built around Professor Bia Chauhan. I would stop here because uh, there are other aspects to talk about, but this can go on and we can discuss a length. Sometimes when we'll find time, I'll discuss with Professor Singh and Professor Basi that how he, he built up this legacy. This is one point I want, wanted to hear. So, in fact, he was uh, Socrates of sociology, Indian sociology, those times. And he, we, we were so enlightened with his thinking, his thoughts, his questions, his probing, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> now I shift to another point that uh, at that point uh, I would. Uh, with the stories, I would then shift to my point. When I joined him, and I thought that I will do research under him, I proposed him. I mean, I worked on a topic, and that was how uh, students used to work for PhD. So I, I, for four months, I worked in the library, reviewing uh, sociological abstracts and all kinds of things and then came with an idea on doing a study on peasant unrest, peasant movement. He discussed that topic, of course, but he said, no, I, 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 I'm not interested. You think of another uh, topic. So I, I went to library for four months again, and then I came with two ideas, one, uh, uh, the idea, uh, the sociological problem, a research problem I posed about democracy in India, the social origin of democracy in India. So he said, no, this is a different kind of a topic. And I told him that I am interested in, in the role of middle class or new middle class in social change in India. And that is how she, 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 he grabbed that topic and said, this topic you can continue. I thought that a celebrated Durkheimian, a functionalist, telling me to do research on class, class which was considered to be a Marxist category. So, but 
he, he, he agreed to this kind of study. I came to know later on that for him, new middle class or middle class was in fact a kind of a question to Marxian uh, analysis of classes. Because you know that uh, uh, Marx give uh, not enough attention to the middle class, to the new middle class, maybe because of uh, social reality of those times, because middle class was not so important in his times when he studied England and Germany. But, uh, but uh, it, it was some kind of going beyond uh, um, um, Marxist analysis of classes and class theory. So in that sense, perhaps he gave uh, more, more thought to this idea and he, he agreed. And he agreed that I review uh, work on middle class, which were mainly Marxian and then as Professor Singh told and Weberian as well, because Weber also focused on, on the middle class. Of course, and that's a story that I reviewed and I worked under him. So the point is precisely that he was, as I said, that he was his legacy. Therefore, I enti entitled this, this, this lecture as a, as a legacy of a positivist. A legacy, you know, a term of initially used for legacy of property and money, handing down money and property. But later on, legacy was used, anything or something to pass on to uh, pass one generation to another generation. So that legacy he passed on, that positivism or scientism is always open to questioning, new questions, new concepts, new theories you can talk about. So in that sense, he passed on that legacy and therefore, uh, I, 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 I argue that even the work in a Marxian perspective on the middle class is his legacy, his ideas. And there are so many stories with me that how he, he by his questioning, by his suggestions, by his supervisions, he enlightened me to, to, uh, to take a route of understanding of the middle class. I would only focus one because uh, to talk about middle class would be a very uh, I mean, lengthy one, would need many lectures, not one, but I would focus only one uh, tradition, which is which I think very important to me uh, and also very important to sociology. And as I said, the, in the days of anti-history, this idea, this concept of history is very significant. What is it? In fact, uh, he was, uh, uh, as uh, mentioned by Singh, Professor Singh, that in his study of a Rajasthan village, if you study Rajasthan village, you'll find this, there is a chapter on, the first chapter on the history of the village and how he, and, and you, you go through other uh, st uh, village studies, either Dubey's or Amin Shinivas or Ajibeli or any other study. Except uh, in the study of D.N. Majundar, you'll find less emphasis on the history of, of a village and a great deal of emphasis of history of village. In Professor Bia Chauhan's work, and not only on the history of village, later on when this idea developed further in Professor Chauhan, in his later last works, before he died, uh, in his last work, which is rural life, a gra grassroots perspectives, I mean, in that book, in that book, his first thesis how to conduct village studies, how to study a, uh, villages. The first thesis is about history. 
village in history and history in, in, in a village, both, uh, or history of a village and village in, in history. And this is in fact a very, very different kind of idea than classical functionalism, classical positivism. But I, I'm reminded of August Kuhn, he also emphasizes on, on, on the study of historical progression. But in that sense, he was, a, a, he was a, an outstanding positivist because I don't find that kind of emphasis on history, study of history in other positivist functionalists particularly. So in that sense, he, he, he gave us a path to walk that how you can conduct uh, a, a study of anything, either a village or a town or not in even town uh, or a class, caste or anything. So at this moment, I would uh, focus on this kind of legacy I got from Professor Bia Choha, that how history can help me in understanding the nature of the middle class. Though in my later times, I studied the history of Europe as well, the history of England and the history of uh, France as well, to know the nature of the middle class here. But at those, that time, I focused on this insight, the insight of history and how can it be useful for, for, a, for, a, for a scientific study of the new middle class. So this is one. Now, let me focus on how I was, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm just mentioning the legacy. Legacy, how that legacy continued and shifted from functionalism to Marxian, uh, Marxian thinking. So I use that idea of studying any phenomenon, any concept, anything in terms of history that enlightened me. And therefore this question when came to my mind that middle class has some role to play with social change. Let me tell you that in Marxian analysis, it, it, it has been argued that the, that the class of bourgeoisie, bourgeois um, uh, if often translated as the middle class in the old works in Marxian times, that the class of bourgeoisie, which was middle class before the advent of capitalism, in the times of feudalism, it was a middle class. It played some role in bringing about changes, in bringing about nationalism, in bringing about democracy, in bringing about individualism, in bringing about many cultural social changes in the Western world. That is in the in the aftermath of industrial revolution and in some societies, political revolutions, this class of bourgeoisie played a significant role in changing society, not only economically, but politically, socially, and culturally. So that was the role of bourgeoisie played. Later on, Marx, when proclaimed that a new class, the class of proletariat, the class of working class would play a role in social change, political social change, then economic social change, and then all kinds of changes, social changes, cultural and so on and so forth. So these two class were identified as a, as a career, as, as some kind of agencies of social change in the Marxian literature. But when I, I, I studied the history of India, modern India, I found that there is some kind of a role of the middle class categories, middle class groups, middle class categories in, the, in social change, particularly in nationalism, in the rise of nationalism. So that after studying many studies, I found this. So that is how I found the relevance of studying history and middle class in history. And this gave me a, a, another idea 
which also while discussing with Professor B.R. Chauhan, and uh, that uh, there is two phases of uh, middle class and two phases of history in the middle class in India, in modern India. One is uh, the phase, what I call that time, phase of imperialism, phase of colonialism. And uh, then there is a phase of after colonialism, uh, I mean, after our independence. Then the Professor Johan gave me idea that why to talk about imperialism? Talk in terms of dependency and independency. And then the two phases were identified that social change by middle class in, in India before independence, that is dependency and after independence. So the point was simple and point is simple. Now I come to that point that how uh, the role of middle class in social change can be analyzed. Number one, that before independence, the role of middle class was different. And from here, we got this idea that the middle class, the origin of social origin of middle class before independence was a different kind. When I could say social origin, I remember that he guided a thesis on the social origin of, of parliament members, of good study. So the idea of social, studying social origin, also idea with the argument of history. So uh, I, when I studied the social origin of middle class in India before independence, in dependency, I found that middle class originated mainly, now I'm summarizing the thesis, mainly in, in elite and landed classes middle class, mainly in elite and landed classes, not in the marginalized classes, not in the subaltern classes. And also they originated only mainly in, in high caste and generally uh, people living in urban areas, urban classes. So that I found that uh, when we analyze the history of the middle class, in the dependency period, I found that the middle classes originated in these categories. This is one. So now you can say, I mean, you talk of any important middle class persons before independence, you'll find that all they hail from well, uh, uh, well off classes, urban classes, high caste, uh, elites, and so on and so forth, landed classes. So this was a character of the middle class, social character of the middle class. And not only this was social character of the middle class, accordingly, they played a definite role in, in, in society. Of course, you know that in social reforms, in cultural reforms, they played a definite role right from the beginning excluding a few people, only few people, few people who can be named on fingers. So generally these played the reforms, social reform movements that started, not only reform movements, they also played some role in education. Uh, you might be knowing the fact that when universities opened up in India, that was a dependent uh, society. They, ah, they were opened up in, in, in nine, first three universities were opened up in 1950. Before those universities, there were schools opened up by Britishers. And there, how they created some educated middle class. And this educated middle class was not only, uh, not only uh, prone or positive for reforms and uh, cultural reforms, but also they developed some idea of uh, idea of political consciousness. They became politically conscious. And generally when they visited England or they studied England, they found 
that a, a democracy is evolving in England, a new political system is evolving in England, and there they, they, they started thinking that uh, some political independence is also needed in India. And there's how that they started playing a role in national movement. They organized uh, the Indian National Congress and other formations. And those formations played a role, a political role in the, in the making of independent India. So in that sense, middle class became an initiator of change. In Western world, the role was a different order, a different kind. But in India, after during the times of independence, the role became more, more social change oriented and they started playing certain roles in political changes as well. So this is one story. Not only uh, in, in, in independent India, that was kind of a role, but sometimes some sections of the middle class also started addressing communal issues, communal questions, community questions. So it, so, so it also played a role in the making of identity, a different identity, not only an independent identity of India during our independent struggle, but also some kind of other identities as well, identities, communal identities we call community identities was also in making. So I'll come to that point. But in the second phase, the role of middle class, the, the nature of middle class started changing. That is also a lesson of history. When you study history, then you find that the role started, the character of the middle class started changing. How? After independence, many universities and colleges were opened up. Many other initiatives were taken up and also constitutional initiative was also taken up like reservation and other policies. And therefore, the nature, uh, the origin of middle class started changing, the social origin. And that social origin in that times, the middle class started growing, started developing in subaltern classes, what we call, in what we call lower caste, OBCs, not only OBCs, but the marginalized communities in we found in, in certain tribes, tribal middle class, regional middle class started growing, and in, in a great number of middle class started growing in various sections of society. So na the nature of middle class changed. It did not remain a kind of homogeneous category. By the way, middle class is considered to be amorphous even it is a divided class. So the new, the middle class started dividing into various kind of communities. And because of that reason, I found that the middle role of, role of the middle class did not remain similar. It became heterogeneous. That is how, because it has started raising identity questions. It started raising regional questions start raising communal questions, more, more emphasis. And that is how regionalism, communalism, and, uh, and uh, identity issues became important and various movement we found, various movements we found, we find that different kinds of movements started coming. Not only this, but that this middle class played other kind of role also like environmental issues were being raised, feminist issues being raised later on. So during independency period, particularly up, up, to, up to 90s, the role, the, the character of the middle class changed a lot. And because of that reason, its impact on society started changing. And it also started bringing about parochialism. Now my argument from nationalism to parochialism. During dependency period, nationalism was more important. Broader kind of uh, issues were more, more important. Reforms were more, more important. Now, the role of middle class shifted from a different kind. 
there they demanded for democracy they led to they lead to democracy but during this time instead of democracy question they focus on other identity questions other issues so a different kind of a role of middle class we can find find if we analyze the social uh, the, the the change in the, their social origin their social character and that is how history enriched us so this was another mind it my work stopped here a little bit at that time but i i kept thinking and then i found that what the legacy of professor bhar chauhan suggests that it was dependency to interdependency sorry it was dependency to independency now i can argue for interdependency now you understand my argument scientific argument that we lived before 1947 a period of dependency a political dependence economic dependence and other dependencies then the phase of independency came we became independent politically and also to a great extent economically and socially now we again entered into a different kind of phase when we became interdependent times of globalization so now we shifted to globalization in mind it as the theme of this conference suggests that the globalization is responsible for bringing about change in world order nowadays so globalization not only brought about changes in world order has brought about but is also bringing about change in changes in national orders in in orders of university just to remind you that nowadays perhaps it's not feasible like professor chohan like aristotle walking down the streets of university and talking to students that is not feasible because of information revolution new kind of information technology now there is hardly any need you can be uh, you can have whatsapp group and uh, on those groups you can be active so things things have changed the order has changed so in that sense this this uh, times of interdependency have changed order and now not only order but the nature social origin social character of the middle class also changed now it became more internationalized more more globalized now uh, you, you understand what i argue that i argue i argued in a recent paper also that the nature of global middle class if you are talking about india indian middle class uh, indian new middle class this new middle class has changed has changed a lot in the sense that it has become uh, from national to local to regional to global its outlook has changed the recruitment of the middle class has changed a lot now the recruitment from very many classes very many categories and they, they are more exposed to a global kind of outlook a global culture a global view i am not saying that middle class is not regional is not localized not communalized is it still there but some section of the middle class has changed now here i i, I this idea also leg, represents the legacy of professor bia chauhan that we should distinguish between a old middle class and a new middle class old middle class is a class which was originated in a in a elite landed in a bourgeois section of society and the new new middle class started originating in new kind of origins not only new origins it is it is educationally acquired intelligence acquired culture so it is now is a now more powerful class in terms of its tools its tools are knowledge information technology and so on and so forth so this middle class has changed i, I mean, there is you you can i can give plenty of examples 
that the section of the this middle class is economically economically rewarded enough rewarded sometimes more than capitalist is rewarded so this new middle class is a different kind of a category and this global middle class is playing a definitely different kind of a role in nowadays society of course the basic role is same some section contributes to change and some section contribute to stability stagnancy but <clears throat> the but global middle class has a has a tremendous cultural role to play through new kind of technological innovations and so on and so forth and it has become interdependent is one foot is in india for example and one foot in in us another foot in uk another foot in china so this middle class in that sense has become a very global and uh, very different and perhaps it would lead to certain cultural changes which we, we even can't imagine at the moment so my, my point is that uh, uh, the middle class the new middle class has become a very important during this independence period and i i could get this insight from that legacy what we call the legacy of positivism which gives not only emphasis on scientific methodology uh, the openness to questions all the time changing your theories and concepts but at the same time it gives enough emphasis on the scientific study of history in terms of phases so with this view i i think that uh, professor chauhan's legacy is not restricted to durkheim davis or functionalism it is it opens up and if you go through his recent work published in 2009 then you find a new kind of a uh, new kind of insight insight of history as well so these words i stop and open to questions thank you professor rajesh mishra to present uh, a very thoughtful lecture for us and uh, to some extent uh, i became emotional when you were talking of professor chauhan and uh, the way he was uh, interacting with his students and being one of his students i have also been part of those uh, walking small trips from department to home and on sunday from his home to medical college or to a long walk to shastri nagar uh, when whole family was busy in watching tv at home Uh, professor chauhan with his students was going for walk and many things uh, which i learned from him were during those walks so i think these were very fruitful open discussions he was very open and uh, although we were not uh, so feel free because of he was a great intellectual of his time and we were maintaining a lot of uh, you know uh, from our side we were worrying that he may mind and but he was very open in his approach and he has given lot of tips to us that about sociology how to do sociology that is most important that was the part of the training and i would like to add uh, something uh, which you talk Uh, about uh, the history of village and village in history and the history he looks upon in a very different way 
and I remembered uh, one of his lecture on Durkheim. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, when I was doing Amphil. So he was taking a class uh, of MA students and uh, we used to sit in his MA classes when we were doing our Amphil research and silently we were entering in the class and on the back uh, benches we just sit and listen him. Even the senior faculties were also doing this practice. Because when he is taking MA class, it was not an ordinary class. It was a research class, in fact, and we learnt many things. So one day he was uh, discussing uh, uh, a very new kind of thing which is related to history, and that is the historicity of phenomena. And he gave example from the elementary forms of religious life. So he said, if we want to understand it is by the approach of Durkheim, in fact, what is followed and explained that in elementary forms of religious life, Durkheim has, re has realized that if we want to understand the present form of religious life, we have to go in the historicity of the phenomena. That how there was, how the religion started from where religion really started and how it evolved. And this evolution of religion, he say it is the historicity of the phenomena. So when we are studying or doing research on any phenomenon, we have to go in the historicity, not history, historicity of the phenomenon, how it originated. And another thing, I think you were also present in that discussion. We were uh, walking with him uh, towards medical college. And that was uh, the career of a concept. And he said, concept, uh, what a concept is today. And what it was, when it was originated, it also has a history. And he said that a concept also has a career. Like a person started with a small post and then he became professor from lecture to professor. That is the a kind of career. And he said concept also has a career. So for example, the concept of function when first of all it was started in anthropology, how it developed further by Parson, by Merton, Parsons and other like Kingsley Davis and others. Then neo-functionalism. So he said, concept is also a carrier. So I think this is idea came to from Emai Durkheim. That is, we go to in the historicity of the phenomena of a concept. I think this is very relevant uh, what we learned from him uh, during our uh, student life as a his research students, and many things became clear to us. And I think uh, a lot of things uh, you have presented about middle class and how the middle class has changed over a period of time, how its origin, character, and uh, the nature has changed uh, over a period of time in India. I think uh, it is uh, one of the very important uh, thing uh, we, you have presented to us. So I think uh, that uh, uh, Professor Chauhan's uh, legacy or a legacy of a, we can say positivist, but I think uh, he was not simply positivist, but more than a positivist. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, would you like to say something? Huh. Yes. Yes, you want to say something? Yes. Hmm. Can I? Uh, yeah. Please. Uh, yes. I mean, you, you, you were mentioning the career of a concept, about a career of concept. So when I started this study, you also uh, asked me to, to, to analyze 
middle class in terms of his career, and uh, which I I didn't uh, speak at this moment. But when uh, when I studied the career of a concept, so I told you very very briefly that the middle class, in fact, the idea, the middle class, even Marx discusses dialectically that middle class before capitalism started taking ground in Europe, middle class was there, but middle class in terms of uh, those who were town dwellers. And those times in, in here in England, known as burgees, burgess or burgees living in town. Burgia is a, is a term used by French for towns. So, and those who are living in, in, in towns of France, they used to be called burghers or burgers. So later on, when a sec important section of this middle class started growing and became, after commercial revolution, it became more rich during the period of around 1550 to 1600, they became rich. And they they were known as bourgeoisie or bourgeois, and these bourgeoisie were rich middle class of uh, uh, middle class. So middle class was divided in Europe in mainly two sections. One consists of upper echelon of the middle class called bourgeoisie, and Marx used the term also petty bourgeoisie for those classes which are lower in terms of their occupations and other kind of things, they, they, were, they were lower. So in that sense, studying the career of a concept helps us the understanding the nature and the, the, and, and the character of the middle. Similarly, not only they, this, this kind of idea, but when applied to India, and while studying a very famous treatise on the Indian middle classes by B.B. Mishra, a historian, I found that in India also, there are not one section, many sections of middle class. And therefore that idea came that, uh, that can we get an help, a kind of help from two concepts of the middle class. One is the old middle class and other is the new middle class. So that idea of studying middle class came to this career of a career of uh, studying the career of or concept of middle class. We we came to this idea that class middle class is of two type, one old and one one another new. Not in terms of history only, in terms of characters also, in terms of role also. So I want to continue, I mean, you, what you said, that is also we covered that idea when he asked me to uh, study the career of a concept. And that is how Emil Durkheim, the idea from Emil Durkheim helped me to study middle class in terms of a different perspective. I agree. And I agree that it also fits to dialectical model. In, in terms of dialectical model, the middle class has no other opposite class. The bourgeoisie class or the capitalist class has opposite to it, the working class, but the middle class has no opposite. So dialectically, it cannot be conceivable. But when you divide in terms of two classes, then it becomes a contradictory location. Then it becomes, a, you can visualize dialectically from Axian perspective. So the point is what, what I want to hark, what you said rightly, that when you study a career of a concept or career of a phenomenon, you feel enlightened. You, you feel enlightened scientifically, sociologically. And that is how the idea of new middle class came into being in my studies, though the idea was av available, but the idea in that sense was not available. I think uh, some 
people from who are present here would like to say. But first of all, I will invite uh, Tom Wicker to, if you want to say something, your observations. Because you are from United Kingdom. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, sorry, feel slightly put in the, on the spot, but thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor uh, Mishra, for your, your talk. Um, that was um, that was really interesting. Um, I guess one, sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, so one, one question um, that the talk um, raised for me, well, actually a, a, a couple, um, and one question is about the kind of the definition of class at a fundamental level and whether in your work on Indian middle classes, you might say, you're looking at that, um, if you're looking at that just from a Marxist perspective of how that section of society, their relationship to the means of production differs from the ruling class and from the working class, or if you think there's value in also including, you know, for example, Weberian um, characteristics of class in terms of status, um, or if there's, if there's ideas there from, from Durkheim as well that have influenced the way that you're defining what distinguishes one class from another. Um, and then I also had a question about so you've got those two categories of the new middle class and the old middle class, whether, whether there are also divisions within those categories. So for example, where you were talking about um, there being uh, sections of the new middle class within um, tribal groups, and whether there are significant differences with those sections of the, of the new middle class and, and other sections of the new middle class, um, for example, or, or other other divisions that came up in your work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. May I respond? Yep, of course. Yes, thank you. Thank you for raising this question. In fact, uh, in in Marxian, uh, so among Marxian sociologists. Uh, I was uh, I was influenced by two insights. One was uh, by what uh, a U.S. sociologist recently died, Eric Olin Wright. Eric Olin Wright, I reviewed his work. Eric Olin Wright discusses that uh, uh, there are three classes in Marx in Marxian literature. Or in Marx, Marx also mentions, even his uh, in his I mean his work the, the the Capital also he mentions this, that there are two main classes, one is uh, uh, the bourgeois class the the capitalist class and the other is the working class, and in between exists an amorphous categories of people, uh, for example lawyers teachers, shopkeepers and a small uh, businessman, an amorphous category of people, which he called the petty bourgeois class, okay? So this is, I mean, for, for uh, Eric Olin Wright, these are three classes in terms of uh, what we call surplus value, production of surplus value. That one class produces surplus value, that is the class of, workers and other class appropriate surplus value does not produce surplus value the capitalist class and the, the uh, and uh, the, the third one neither produces surplus value nor appropriate surplus value and they are made of various very many categories and in between them there are three contradictory locations this is one idea which i reviewed and found a little bit a uh, little bit insightful to, to, to define a middle class. But, but here, as you rightly said, that it, it is not a class, rather it is a, a, a group of classes, a middle classes. 
often known as. But later on, there's another British uh, sociologist, I, the, uh, at the moment, I'm unable to recall his name, but he in fact gave an idea which influenced me like anything. And he gave an idea that in, if you review Marx's works, you find that there are two matrices on which classes are defined, two, two kind of uh, matrices. One is in terms of ownership and non-ownership of means of production, as you mentioned, that those who own uh, means of production is in one category, and those who do not own means of production, another category, working class and the capitalist class. And he also that in terms of another access, you can define a class, Marx defines a class. And that access is a production of surplus value and non-production of surplus value or appropriation of surplus value, whatever you like to you call. So one class produces surplus value, but do not own means of production is the working class. And one class owns means of production, but do not, does not produce surplus value is the capitalist class. These two classes categories in terms of two dialectical axes. But in between, there can be two categories. If you examine it logically, he says, one which are Owner of means of production, mind it, owners, small owners, and also producers of surplus value. They work on their own means of production. For example, a lathe machine worker or a carpenter. Not only he owns uh, means of production, means of tools, tools of production, but also work on them. Uh, so this is one category. Another category can be neither own means of production, they don't, do not own means of production, and neither work on them, the categories of those people. This is the category of the new middle class, what is known as the another section of the middle class, because they, the, what they have, they have only one positive character that they are, they have some competence, which is educationally acquired. They can be managers, they can be technicians, they can be other kind of operators. They do not own tools of production, means of production, but neither they produce surplus value. So negative, negative, but their positive character is that they have educationally acquired technical competence. So if you, nowadays you found in industry or when I was working in early 1970s, I found in industries, different four sections of people, four categories of people. One owning means of production, owning factory and working on them. In between there, there are many technicians, many managers, many kind of people, white collars, those who neither own means of production nor work on them, sorry, not, not produce surplus value. And there were some other categories of people, small businessmen, small owners, kind of people. That is how in Marxist, perspective, you visualize a class, mind it. If you visualize class only in terms of, I mean, I'm reminded of the last chapter of capital. In that chapter, which is, which is, which is only one and a half page uh, written and Marx died, therefore could not write furthermore. But the name of the chapter is on classes. In that chapter, he mentions three great classes. He begins with three great classes. One is, of course, bourgeoisie, the class of owners. Another is the capitalist class. And the third class he mentions, the class of rentiers. I'm telling you this, that in Marx, there's so many explanations, so many definitions, and so many concept of classes that sometimes it's, it confuses you. However, Marx was clear when analyzing class structure of any society. He was so clear in even in the manifesto of Communist Party, he wrote very clearly that there are two classes and one in between the petty bourgeois or the classes 
of uh, lawyers, teachers, small shopkeepers, and other categories. So he mentions these three classes. So the point is precisely that even if you think dialectical, dialectically or dialectical logically, then you can also visualize middle class or middle classes. I find that two middle classes can be found in Marxian logic. And uh, if, uh, one is the old middle class, the class of those who produce surplus value as well as own means of production, but a smaller scale. And another, another class do not own means of production, do not produce surplus value, help in help capitalists to supervise, to technically, technically maintain uh, the, the, the industry or the work organization, they can be categorized as the middle class. In that sense, I visualize the middle class Marxian sense, of course. But because I was talking of the legacy of Professor B. R. Chauhan, so what that legacy provided me, the insight, that is how I was placing middle class in the history of India. But middle class can also be analyzed in the history of any society, not only as a historical subject, historical object to be saying, sorry, historical object, but also a historical subject. When I say subject in Marxian sense, I mean that in the making of history, in playing its role in, in history, history of any society, history of England, history of France, or even history of India. I find that in history of India, the middle class played a great role. Even now it is playing a great role. Though some argue, some people argue that the middle class, lower middle class particularly, played a definite role in Germany of 19, from 1935 to 1945, which is known as Nazism. So that is another point. I did not open this Pandora box in India at the, at the moment, because my point was precisely recalling, remembering a mentor, how he shaped being non-Marxist rather sometimes uh, he was opposed to Marxism. He not only adjusted uh, a fellow from Marxian tradition, but provided many insights for understanding a phenomenon in India in terms of what I, I emphasize in a Marxian way. When I say Marxian way, I told you that Marxian means some kind of scientific Marxian way, open to questions, open to criticism. Thank you. Now, I think uh, there are some more observations. Please raise your hands who wish to, Pankaj. Okay. Yes, Rashna, first you. Briefly, but very briefly. Thank you, Professor Mishra, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I had uh, two queries, sir. Uh, in the talk, you mentioned 1990s as the time when the middle class, the middle class uh, uh, becomes, say, more prominent. In this, uh, can we look at the three commissions that came in and the disassociation of the middle class uh, with um, labor per se, creation of uh, uh, more, uh, creation of different kinds of occupation? A, huh? And uh, secondly, uh, when we talk of India, where is our arm army and its aspirations vis-a-vis -vis the middle class? Yes. Huh? And uh, so I have one more observation, it is, um, uh, when you say that middle class is global because of its exposure to various geographies, but does, uh, 
the exposure of middle class to the various geographies bring about a, 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 a cultural or a more nuanced understanding of other culture. Uh, is middle class not the career uh, carrier as in you know one who takes forward the morality of a uh, 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 society? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, just uh, I remembered the British sociologist John Ari, John U W R R I Ari John Ari. Yeah, I was uh, I was imbibed to him the idea of the new and old middle class. Indebted to him, so I imbibed from him that idea. Now this question about the global uh, Indian middle class, particularly the new middle class in global India. Uh, I mean, oftenly, the, the last question first and thereafter other. Oftenly, uh, the, the middle class particularly and the new middle class particularly, they're overburdened with the uh, idea of uh, some kind of idea, force idea on them that they are, they have some kind of a moral compass. I mean, uh, that idea is prevalent among common, uh, common people, among laymen, the middle class is the most morally uh, driven class in comparison to the working people or in comparison to capitalist class. It may be true in a sense, that uh, the working class uh, have nothing to lose. So uh, it's very difficult for them to, 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 to have some kind of a moral compass or moral, uh, uh, moral values. I mean, I'm not saying they are immoral, they have their own values. And similarly, capitalist class are beyond kind of these some things. They in fact the creator of values. They have they create the dominant values. What they say, they say now a different kind of tools available to them. They can uh, propagate it with their means of communication, means of propagation. So this is another. And middle class oftenly considered to be more governed by its moral values. Maybe true in to, to, to some extent. But middle class, as I told you, is also uh, uh, also divided by old and new. When we say old and new, that it means they, they, they are career of old values as well as and new values as well. And mind it, this middle class being an educated middle class, particularly the new middle class, is highly articulate highly creative. They think that they are creative, they create culture, they create cultural values. They don't, I mean, in that sense, the middle class in that sense is articulate very, very in, a, in, a diff, in a very good way. But I would say that sometime, sometimes middle class is also very artificial. Sometimes uh, it creates those values which are not real values because it is a very articulate and creative class. And this happens often. Sometimes it can create out of uh, imagination some idea, idea of a community, idea of a nationality, idea of a democracy in its own way, any idea they can create. So they are very creative kind of a class, but mind it. The middle class is also controlled by other classes, other dominant classes. The relationship is oftenly with middle class that it is oftenly economically controlled by the capitalist class. Sometimes technologically also controlled by the middle, uh, the other class, the capitalist class. And because of number, it can be controlled by the lower class also because of number. Though I understand that in India, as you mentioned, 
there are 300, uh, 30, 300 million people in, in the middle class. It's a recent data I'm citing. 300 million, I mean, 30 crore of people. They, they make Indian middle class. Even by quantity, they become very important. Not because of, because of their consciousness, because of their education, because of their other kind of things, they become significant, but also because of their number, they become significant. And because of their, because of their, uh, their capacity to, capacity to influence, they are influencer also. So they can influence politics, they can influence anything. So in that middle class important, so middle class accordingly plays a role. As a, when nowadays it is said that major section of the middle class all over around the world, major section, a significant section is not major. They have become, uh, they, 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 have, they, they, they have become more righteous, more authoritarianism, the prevails authoritarian values, more rightist values. That is often said. And this may be true also. This may be true also. So in that sense, middle class can be a very influential category. Of course, there are hardly any doubt. But I would say that middle class is also influenced. Influenced by, by, by the order, by the emerging order. And this emerging order at the national level, at the local level, or the, at the global level. In that sense, it is highly influenced by order. And uh, no, you, you understand the order is controlled by nowadays by many, many uh, new social media. And when I'm talking of social media, maybe by Twitter, maybe by Facebook, maybe by WhatsApp, maybe, maybe by other things. And they can believe on totally false things readily. This middle class also can believe. And with this, this uh, unreal uh, thinking, unreal values, unreal uh, uh, politics, they can influence politics also. So it is a complicated issue. I think uh, now I should invite uh, Dr. Al Kasahu, uh, who has been uh, in Department of Sociology, Merit University, at the time when Professor Chauhan was there, and uh, she has also been a student of Professor Chauhan, and she has travelled from Bijnor to attend this special session only. So. Please say some words, whatever you feel, your observations, please. Yeah, maybe I'm not as lucky as you people, because you directly worked with him. You did your PhD under him. I was only, definitely I was a student there in 1984 to 1986. I did my MPhil there and uh, first year with two semesters. So he used to come to the US in theoretical lectures and they were really very enlightening. And secondly, whenever there were some seminars, so his aura was such that everybody was used to sit like this, spellbound, but we used to talk. And second year of my MFA, uh, because I have got the job, so I was not going to have a partner with him. That was a very efficient period. So I used to meet him sometimes, whenever I used to be a partner. But maybe if I like his I am a little bit scared of him because uh, my first semester of him, he suggested me, rather encouraged me, to work in real sociology. And that was not my interest in specialization that thing. And uh, so directly I couldn't get the PhD in under him. But both of us are in the room, it's all the same. He used to have walks. 
So maybe twice I was also part of this work. And 1986, I remember when there was World Congress of Sociology in Delhi. So when we were boarding the bus to go to Delhi from Meerut, so he instructed all these students that I will, I don't want to see any student of this department talking to each other. Rather, you should talk to the new people in the conference. So, some of my students were not very fluent in English. So, they were really, really hesitant and they were scared, how will they talk to the new people who don't know Hindi? But maybe that time, many students, uh, maybe they didn't like the idea. But later on, maybe the students like me, us, who learned many things from this type of uh, his suggestions. That beyond sociology, you have to do so many other things also. When you be a future teacher uh, later on, so you have to learn how to interact with other people. Because many students are from rural area and even small cities. So their confidence level talking English was not very high. So this I always remember and always cherish and always say to my daughters. You see, other teacher used to guide us like this. Ki, uh, that's why maybe this is part of personality development and different activities which we were used to do. I think the part of sociology in the university played a major role in our personality, in our career, in our sociological orientation. Uh, I exactly right now I remember the previous Rati. Uh, his seminar, the whenever he used to go to the seminar, you know, uh, it was very, really, very really like the way I said, he used to sit like this uh, with a great personality. So, what lucky. We, uh, whatever I have learned from him, uh, I'm really happy. That's all. Thank you, sir. Now, last comment uh, from Pankaj Kumar Singh, who has been a student of uh, uh, Rajesh Mishra as well as uh, he learned uh, in his personal capacity with Professor Chauhan and he has traveled with him at many places. Uh, so I think uh, he's the right person to. Thank you, sir. Sir, Mr. Sir, I am audible, sir. Yes. yes. Sir, if we study the village of Rajasthan, Rana Bato Ki Sadri, and a village of Karnataka, and a village of UP, and a village of Odisha, the interest of middle class and identity of middle class were changed due to time and place. To how to generalize the role of middle class in general perspective, in whole perspective? What are your comments, sir? Thank you, sir. It's a good question. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> there is hardly any doubt that there is hardly any role of any, any one role of the middle class. And uh, because we have been working recently on the rural middle class, emerging rural middle class as well in India particularly. And uh, uh, naturally when you in a society as diverse as India, you find uh, so many uh, groups, communities, caste, and uh, areas. 
and their middle class is very one of course their role would be very one so that would uh, uh, depend on the analysis at the micro level however at the macro level when we try to generalize uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, rather in synthesize in terms of uh, social or political or cultural role of a class then uh, we do it at some cost and the, that cost is of course uh, cost of diversity and variation i agree so uh, if we want to understand middle class uh, of various regions different regions so the final complexities or details can be analyzed in a in a more micro study more in depth study of that region that village that area but at some level of abstraction at some level of abstraction we we social scientists try to try to generalize generalize try to develop a theory of course taking into account the complexities and therefore perhaps these are the gimmicks you can say that the middle class has a variety of different kind of roles in different phases for example in my study i do not claim that middle class always play a role in social change only in this lecture i emphasize this but i also know and i have taken account of the role of middle class in 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 uh, not only in changing but in maintaining status quo maintaining status quo of every kind in terms of uh, maintaining economic status quo or political ah, status quo all kind of status quo is being maintained so is a is a middle class in fact is like education it has a dual kind of role a role of social change and we can identify at social change at many levels at the micro level to macro level and we can generalize in that sense also you can call it a gimmick it also has a role in maintaining a status quo and in terms of this kind of a role you can identify roles of a regional class or roles of a rural class roles of a, a community a middle class in the community in a community and you can find it out so in that sense we as a broad level we say that middle class has many roles to play particularly many roles of social change and many roles of status quo in that sense we use this i know this is a problematic from the point point of view of statistical generalizations i understand this uh, professor kulvinder kaur uh, has to share some observations a uh, very good evening to all uh, so i missed your lecture because i have I have missed your lecture, sir, because I uh, have come to chair the next session. But some of the things which you were saying right now, and when I came, you know, prompted me to just you know share some of my ideas about middle class. I have also written on middle class, and I have argued that the kind of literature which has emerged in India on the middle class in the past twenty years. has been about the you know middle class as a consuming class and the focus has been on the consuming practices of the middle class and the internal heterogeneity of the middle class has also been looked at in terms of only the cultural practices and the special perspective has been uh, is something which has been ignored so i try to you know specialize middle class especially the urban middle class my focus has not been on rural because you have been working on the middle class so i you know would like to know your views on the fact that 
um, if we try and see middle class as new and old, and if we say that the old middle class is getting specialized into pockets, uh, and for example, if we look at shopping malls, then different variety of shopping malls cater to different varieties of middle class depending upon their consumer practices and that specializes them also. So do you think that the same phenomenon is something which we are going to see in what you're calling as the emerging global middle classes in terms of cultural practices? Thank you. Sorry, last point I could not hear because we co. Uh, however, uh, can, can you explain the, the last point? So I looked at, I looked at the specialization of middle class, especially right now we are sitting in Basant Kunj. We have you know, a cluster of malls right next to you know, us. And we see uh, different kinds of consumer clustering in one cluster of middle class, another kind of you know, consumers clustering of middle class consumer clustering in another part of the city, which is probably the West Delhi, and another one which is clustering in Gurgaon. So within new middle class, even if we were to look at, even if we were to specialize cultural practices, we mm -hmm. find that you know, in terms of specialization, we can trace the internal heterogeneity within the other middle class. So yeah. I'm, I want to know that when we study the rural middle classes, especially let's say of a particular region, um, having a common ethnicity or having a common you know, um, culture, in that sense, do you see that kind of specialization emerging amongst the rural middle classes or not? What do you think? That's my question, sir. Thank you for uh, for this important question, uh, Professor Kaur. In fact, uh, uh, this opens a Pandora box in the sense that, uh, I mean, just I'll take a few minutes to de develop my argument, what I say in response. That, uh, in sociology, there are so many determinants around. For example, as you mentioned, I can count some, some, some determinants. One is, uh, for example, an ethnicity. Ethnicity or ethnic identity can be a determinant. But many sociologists think that caste is also a determinant in India. Religion identity can also be a determinant. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, habitat structure in which you live can also be determinant. As for example, you have given that example. A uh, Basant Kunj and Basant Bihar and any, any uh, Joparpati around. So can be, this can also be a determinant. So there are so many determinants Perhaps statistically, I don't, I, I, as far as I understand statistics, perhaps there is hardly any statistical tool to, 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 to control these kind of uh, uh, factors, contaminating factors, and can say with a claim that this factor is responsible for this. I mean, this is the nature of society, nature of not only society, but I mean, where I live is, is much more homogeneity, but where I live, uh, 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 by, at the moment I'm living, but as India, I, Indian, I know that this, there's so much diversity around that perhaps I find that there is hardly any society with so much diversity. And diversity of tradition, traditionally handed down, and diversity of new kind of living in India. So don't mind, you, your, 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 your question uh, would not be answered. So, however, however, 
I would argue that we, when we talk in terms of class, so uh, many sociologists, many historians, they have culled out that how, mm -hmm. how <laughs> class was an important factor uh, in, 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 in the macro level history of the world. For example, I give you one example. For example, when the class of bourgeois rose, uh, arrived in, uh, in, in Britain or France or Germany, uh, in, just after, in the aftermath of industrial revolution. So when it arrived, it started influencing at the wider level, not only the politics of society, economy of society, but also cultural and social levels of society. But it can only be with a vision of a sociologist, it can be culled out. But authentically, much more down, I mean, variation at the, and at, the, at the lower level, at the micro level, perhaps it would be difficult to identify. But at the broader level, you can say, well, when you, you review a macro level history, for example, democracy, which we know nowadays, but democracy was a contribution of a bourgeoisie in Britain up to 19, up to 1830. The situation was very a different kind. But because of this rise of bourgeoisie, uh, or even little before the rise of commercial classes, political party as such started emerging. That's and with the rise of the proletariat classes, the working class, a new party started rising. So Tories, Liberal Party, Tories Conservative Party, Liberal Party, now Lib Dem, and uh, Labour Party. They started, Labour Party arrived after the, the growth of, tremendous growth and solidarity among working people. So Labour Party also arrived on the scene. So these can be culled out. So at the broader micro level, we can analyze the impact of classes. Similarly, impact of the middle classes or new middle classes can be at the broader level, can, you can identify, you can analyze. But if you go in the complex minor details and complexities, perhaps it would need more appropriate fine methodologies to identify this, M more comparative studies of comparing west part of Delhi, eastern part of Delhi, and the south, southern part of Delhi. I know the southern part of Delhi, in terms of cultural habits, even cultural way, ways, different than East Delhi. Delhi East, which live in the, in the far east, I understand that. But within, a, within a city, but mind it, the city is, is of more than 10 million people. 150 million people, 150 million voters. Now the, you 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 are going to have the, uh, that that uh, elections of municipality there. So the point is precisely that it, it, that depends on the kind of question, question formulation of a question, formulation of a problem, where you are formulating at the micro level. Then you would need, but definitely these can. What I am saying can provide you insights. The role of middle class in democracy, the role of middle class in nationalism, the role of middle class in bringing about cultural reforms, social reforms, or role of middle class in bringing about or in contributing to fascism, or in contributing to Nazism, authoritarianism, that can be identified at a macro broader level. Of course, different kinds of tools would be needed more historical methodology would be needed than at the micro level. So this is the difference. So at this moment, I can't say anything, but I can visualize that what is the difference between West and South Delhi, between Basan Kunj and Basan Bihar, between Ajopatpati, because of their nature of habitat they live. So that would impact the nature of classes there, the middle class there, the, the, the owning classes there, and the lower classes. That would 
made a difference. The nature of habitat, nature of community, Muslim middle, middle class would behave at a certain level or differently. But my one of my Swedish friends, she studied the middle class of my town, where I live, Lucknow. She, she came with an idea which, in fact, uh, people like us visualize 20 years back, similar kind of middle class, the, the role of middle class, the nature of middle class in our town. Recently, she studied. So in this way, we can say that uh, at certain level, you can, you can analyze, you can understand, you can tell the nature, the role of the middle class, the impact of the middle class. At, at more complex level, you need more complex methodologies. Well, I think now this is the time to conclude the session. We have already over 15 or 20 minutes. Now I request to my co-chair, uh, Professor uh, Somani Saad, to conclude, briefly conclude, and uh, also uh, propose a thanks to the audience and to Professor Rajesh Mishra for being with us uh, for more than two hours. Thank you, Mishra ji. It was a time to uh, enjoy the talk between colleagues and uh, talk with talk about mentor, remembering him. And uh, uh, what I enjoyed most is I corroborated what my colleague told me about Professor Birajirat Chauhan. Professor Abbasi is my colleague. And he was narrating all these things what you had discussed. I, it was good to learn about the middle class and types of classes and, and various other classes within. Uh, it was uh, such a wonderful lecture uh, uh, that was uh, uh, given by Professor Mishra about his, in memory of his mentor. Uh, thank you, sir, for being with us for such a long time. Uh, if you recall, we had met once at Lucknow. Uh, yes. So re-remembering our meeting. Yes. And thank you, order, audience, for your patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. We proceed for a tea and we'll reassemble here after uh, I, maybe 10 I'll minutes. have also my morning tea okay, here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My, okay, thank you very much.